Welcome back. As America debates how old is too old to be president, the youngest candidate uh, that's announced in the 2024 field is currently introducing himself to voters. Vivek Ramaswamy is a 37-year-old multimillionaire who graduated from Harvard College and Yale Law School. He made his fortune at a hedge fund and in biotech, and he ran an asset management company which calls itself anti-woke. A first-time candidate for political office, he says he has plans to start an anti-woke cultural movement. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis. That leaves a vacuum in its way. And when you have a vacuum that runs that deep, that is when poison fills the void. Pick your favorite one. Wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, globalism, COVIDism. And Vivek Ramaswamy joins me now. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, welcome back. Uh, actually, welcome to Sunday Meet the Press. Thank you. Good to see you again, Jeff. Um, let me start with this overall look. You've got this anti-wokeism. You've written books about this. You've, this is your political identity as you've introduced yourself uh, to folks. I get it in a primary. Mm -hmm. Why are you convinced this message could actually work if you got the nomination in a general election? I think I'm speaking as a member of my generation here, Chuck, but I think it's true of all Americans. We're all hungry for a cause right now in America. We're hungry for purpose and meaning at a point when the things that used to fill our hunger for purpose, faith, mm -hmm. patriotism, family, hard work, these things have disappeared. So I see an opportunity to revive our missing national identity. I think that's something that Americans hunger for across the political spectrum, mm -hmm. answering what it means to be an American today. You ask people my age that question, you get a blank stare in response. I think that is the vacuum at the heart of our national soul. I'm running for president to revive the ideals that actually set the nation into motion. I think it's going to unite the country. You know, it's interesting. Your rhetoric can sound uniting and your answer just now. But then you, you say the following things. The trans movement has become a cult. We need to abandon climate religion in America. I definitely find the idea of systemic racism revolting. I say this. How do you square those statements? With unification, these are divisive times. This is a polarizing time. We're pretty evenly divided on these cultural issues. How do you unite, do you unite the country when you're essentially denigrating the views of half the country? I don't think I'm denigrating the views of half the country. I mean, let's take the touchiest of those subjects right now on the trans issue. Mm -hmm. I think that when a kid says that I'm born into the wrong body, that my gender doesn't match my biological sex, mm -hmm. more often than not, that is a case of a mental health disorder. That doesn't mean you disrespect that person. Mm -hmm. It means they're crying out for help. I met with two young women who regret the decisions they made going through double mastectomies, one a hysterectomy, chemical intervention, now trying to teach kids across the country that when you're struggling inside, going through adolescence, yes, that involves some struggle. We live in a cultural moment today where adults are affirming that confusion rather than actually you ever treating them compassionately. That's a, cruelty. You ever talk to parents? That have a, a, a kid who's going through this? I have, actually. Yeah, yeah and I, I think mean, it's, I mean, it's a parent. My point it's is a difficult this. place to be. I acknowledge That's right. that. But yeah. what we need to do on both sides here is act with compassion, not really what makes us feel good about ourselves. Yeah. And I think that's my main issue across what our response to well, transgenderism and the climate. It's solving the actual underlying issues okay. rather than what allows you to signal your virtue. What makes it compassionate, though, to uh, pass a law that denies a parent? Uh, uh, making their own health care decision for their kid. That's the part of this. That doesn't sound very conservative in small government to me. Well, look, there isn't a state in this union that allows you to smoke an addictive cigarette before the age of 18 that allows you to get a tattoo before the age of 18. That's a body-altering change that a kid may later regret in life. So I think it is perfectly reasonable to say that if you're after 18 years old, you're free to decide whatever you want to do. That's what it means to live in a free country. But below the age of 18, I think it's perfectly legitimate to say that we won't allow genital mutilation or chemical castration through puberty blockers you're for the purpose of that, gender transition. But how do you know it's that? Again, how do you know? Are, are you confident that you know that gender uh, is uh, as binary as you're describing it? Are you confident that I it am. isn't a spectrum? I uh, am. Do you know I'm, this as a scientist? Well, there's there's two X chromosomes if you're a woman, an X and a Y. That means there's you're a, a man. lot so of scientific a research out this. there. There's a lot of scientific research out there that says gender is a spectrum. Chuck, I, I respectfully disagree. Gender dysphoria for most of our history, all the way through the DSM-5, has been characterized as a mental health disorder. And I don't think it's compassionate to affirm that. I think that's cruelty. When a kid is crying out for help, mm -hmm. what they're asking for is, you got to ask the question of what else is going wrong at home? What else is going wrong at school? Let's be compassionate and get to the heart of that, rather than playing this game as though we're actually changing right. our medical understanding I, for the last hundred years. I go back years. to this.
if a parent is dealing with a child that has these, that, yes. that may have these issues, trust me, the parent, the last thing they want to do is consider something like this. But if that is what they think could help their child pursue happiness or they're not to kill themselves, I, why take away that option? Again, it, why shouldn't it be up to the parent? So w part of why parents now suddenly feel that way, let's ask ourselves that, Chuck, because we've created a culture that teaches parents that they're being bigoted or that they're bad people if they don't actually mm -hmm. take those steps. So part of what I think is, listen, gender dysphoria for the rare few people who have suffered it mm -hmm. is a condition of suffering. My question is, why on earth are we going out of our way mm -hmm. to create even more of it? And there's no doubt that the cultural movement in this country, even education, is creating more gender dysphoria. If it's a condition of suffering, yeah. let's not create more of it. That's what we're doing. Let me ask you about the Disney dust off sure. with Ron DeSantis. On one hand, I assume you agree uh, with pushing back at Disney the way Governor DeSantis has rhetorically. Um, but is there a point where you think it uh, is too much to use government to punish business? Here's where Ron DeSantis really lost it here. He's gone on the wrong path. It's, he claimed, and this part actually sounded good to me, Disney should have never had crony capitalist lobbying related privileges in the first place. Here's the part he doesn't mention. One of those crony capitalist privileges was, and I think the most relevant one, was codified into law by none other than Ron DeSantis in 2021. Mm -hmm. So Florida passed this political anti-discrimination statute, which I applauded at the time, mm -hmm. said if you operate internet companies, this includes streaming services like Disney does, that you can't engage in viewpoint discrimination. Now here's the funny, dirty little secret of that. They wrote into a last minute exception into that law for mm -hmm. anyone who also operates a theme park more than 25 acres in the state of Florida. For, for, yeah, That's for, crony for. capitalism. And so the irony is Ron DeSantis, who's now railing against crony capitalism and rolling that back, yeah. was the one who actually passed that into law for the case of Disney. So I think that undermines the credibility of his crusade. I prefer to get to root causes rather than doing political stunts. Let me ask you about the idea of cancel culture, because it, I, I, I feel like the criticism that the right was making of the left two years ago, that it looks like some on the right are embracing cancel culture. I think Bud Light. I think about the, the transgender representative in Montana who was basically kicked, not allowed to speak on the floor. Do you think some of this is going too far? So look, I'm an opponent of victimhood culture, cancel culture, you name it. I've written a book about this. I do think that the way the culture war ends is not with a bang, but with a whimper, where both sides get infected mm -hmm. by those same norms. You think so the, the, the right's been infected by this? One of the things I say to conservative audiences across the country is we have to be the party of free speech and open debate. Mm -hmm. We can't be the party said, that says, I won't talk to, I'm here talking to you on NBC. There's other candidates in this race that say they won't talk to NBC News. Ron DeSantis is one of them. Well, I go to college campuses where other candidates refuse to go. So I think we've got to practice what we preach. I'm in this race as a millennial, as a young person who's lived the American dream, to actually walk the walk when it comes to free speech and open debate. And yes, I would like to see other Republicans rise to that occasion and do better, starting with the debate stage in our own party this fall. If Donald Trump doesn't do debates, uh, will you not support him if he's the nominee? Well, I'm not going to let him get away with that. Donald Trump... What does I, that mean? <laughs> what do you mean you're not going to let him get away with it? He's, well, look, he can I, do what he wants to do. I don't think the other candidates, including Donald Trump, are going to relish being on that debate stage with me. But I think that the way that he's shown in 2015, what people gave him credit yeah. for was that he was an outsider and a disruptor. I'm the outsider in this race. And I think that if you want to be part of, like yeah. Joe Biden, in an existing establishment that doesn't want to debate, I think what, people are what, hungry for new What blood. should the party use as leverage to force him to, to show up on the debate stage? I think it's the voters. I think it's my job and it's the job of candidates to tell voters that if you want someone sitting across the table from mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, if you want someone with the spine to take on the administrative state, mm -hmm. it's the top of my domestic agenda, you better darn well not be scared to show up on a debate stage with the new challenger. Donald Trump did a great job of that in 2015. Yeah. I'm the outsider in this race. You have indicated you would support a six-week abortion ban if you were a governor of a state and all this. What would you do on a federal level? So, uh, so would, 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 you, would you create a floor? So I'm, I, I believe in being principled on this, Chuck. I'm unapologetically pro-life. And like many in the pro-life movement, I believe that abortion is a form of murder. Murder, though, is regulated by the states, not by the federal government. I believe in the Constitution. I think Roe was wrongly decided. I've said so for a long time. This is a matter for the states, not the federal government. And I, and I stand on principle there. When does a fetus have constitutional rights? So look, six weeks is at the end of life when you lose brain waves. That's yeah. our that's our moment of but death. Does, does, where in the Constitution does it say someone has constitutional rights as a fetus? It does, it's not codified in the Constitution. That's right. why this is a matter for the states. But I do believe that I'm unapologetically pro-life. But one of the areas where we can do better in the pro-life mm -hmm. movement is to walk the walk. 
provide an easier option for women to get to yes, I support a conversation about adoption, child care, even greater yeah. responsibility for men. I think that's how we turn this issue into being a less divisive one. One of your been. big applause lines that is a bit of a head scratcher for me is defund the FBI. Yeah. So if you I, I didn't get... say defund the FBI. I said shut down the FBI and replace okay. it with something new. Yeah. So you want to shut down the FBI? Yeah. What are you replacing it with? I think it's a new apparatus built from scratch that actually respects the law instead of making it up. And the funny thing, Chuck, is if you look at over the last... think the FBI constantly is making up the law. That is a huge charge. They, they have just stopped major fentanyl, uh, uh, you know, been able to yes. get rid of... Well, I mean, there's a lot of work the FBI does I think, other than respond to complaints from elected officials who don't like investigations. Well, actually, if you look over the course of the last 60 years, J. Edgar Hoover, what he did to Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. that was an affront. It's still the J. Edgar Hoover FBI that people walk into down the street here in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. And I personally believe, as somebody who's running to actually run the yeah. executive branch of the government, when you have a bureaucracy whose culture becomes so ossified, every once in a while you need to turn it over. And I think that, yes, we need federal law enforcement, but that institution has, in a bipartisan way, become so... I think ossified right. in its own norms, in its own corruption, that we need to rebuild it from scratch and have something. So you're going to replace the place. FBI with the F with a new FBI. Well, with a new institution built from scratch to to carry out federal law enforcement, because the existing FBI, the people who work there, have worked there for so long that actually they're going to get be getting in their own way. I think that that's actually important. And by the way, I also right, support. It does this. sound like it does sound like you're just replacing the FBI with the FBI. Well, the problem is there's people who have worked there for decades, and so what I say is if I'm the U.S. president and I can't work for the federal government for more than eight years, which I think is a good thing, hmm. then none of those bureaucrats reporting right. into me should either. That's the point I'm making. All right. Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, you bring uh, some energy to your campaign. We'll be following it. Uh, thanks for coming on and uh, sharing your views with us. It's good seeing you, Chuck. Thank All you. Right.